Hello, hello, hello. Oh. Greetings, awesome. greetings. You chose the short science uh, intro. My I goodness. did. Did you think you had, I was looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, what's going to relate to this chat? And I'm thinking, ah, oh, science. We'll do that one. So uh, welcome, Bernie, and uh, welcome, Lucas, from the LC King YouTube channel. How are you? Hi. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. We've actually... I think I first asked you for an interview about probably two years ago, and we've only just got yeah. we've only just got it together. So, all in due time. <laughs> Don't it, rush these it, things. And the, the universe unfolds exactly how it's supposed to, and now we are here and ready for this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We so, are, so, and hello, everyone in chat. Uh, I won't go through your names. I'll put them up on screen. Thank you all for being here. And we're going to jump in um, today. We're going to talk about the realm we live in and um, a bit about L, L electricity, those, those gods of the uh, the elect. Actually, I was thinking about the word elect the other day. Um, that's what they use, you know, in, in ancient scripture and stuff, don't they? The the elect were the, were the sort of chosen ones, right? And now what do we do? We go and elect people to be the chosen ones of power. That's just crazy. Sure do. Oh, there's so, Callum. Hi, Callum. So, um, Callum's here. Callum's here. Hello, Callum. Hello, everyone else. Thank you all for being here. All right, so let's um, let's just jump straight into it then, hey? We'll get this show on the road. Um, I can present if you like. Where, where do we want to start here, Lucas? Yeah, do you want to present? Um, tell us, tell us what what is this place? What's going on <laughs> here? Oh, I can only. <clears throat> so I'm going to be a little bit <laughs> rusty with this electric ladder now? stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All the, the basic premise of what I've done um, is is basically got uh, a battery and applied it to the flat Earth cosmology. And that was the, the starting point. And then I've tried to fill in all the blanks since then. And so that's that's basically how this process unfolded and there was just uh there was tons of information that kept flowing out of it um once you got that sort of basic premise underway and it was really good um but i'll get this slideshow up and that will mm. help me uh sort of remember because i oh, not... haven't really been focused on the electric flat earth for quite a while now so this is going to be a refresher for yeah, me <laughs> um and it's interesting because until we got the the flat earth model all these kind of um you know thoughts and and stuff couldn't really happen could they you know if the sun was out 90 million miles away and we were spinning through space chasing it that's a completely different model to two um polarities energies circling you know orbiting around a, a stationary plane isn't it it's a completely you know and, and from oh, that then you can kind of get the anode cathode the power so all that kind of stuff comes out of that doesn't it well yeah and it and it connects basically the technology that we have now to how the the world operates so you can actually find parallels yes. in you know and that was the big thing it's like mm. i can parallel what i'm talking about with you know something like a electrolysis or a battery or um vacuum tubes or something realistic and i can show that these are actually you know very um in alignment with each other mm. well I, I think in the end that's all that all technology is right it's just replicating what's already here yeah well, that what well, has to be in nature. Whatever we do has to be in nature. Um, so I started out looking at some of this stuff, and the first thing that sort of clued me into the electric sort of part of this was actually looking at a generator. And um, there's a a wiring diagram in a or wiring in a generator, three phase generator that is called a star coil, and you can overlay that to the zodiac. <laughs> and it fits quite nicely, even to the extent of um, producing the different elements and how they move around the zodiac as well. So they'll have, you know, uh, Earth, the polarities in that sort of in that sort of way. So 
Yeah, I just I just found that that was a really intriguing link, and that sort of set my brain ticking. Um, and I wasn't really looking for a model <laughs> at the start. I was looking to work out what the zodiac was and try and understand it. I was like, here's like a um, cryptic thing that you know I can unravel, and it was like a puzzle for me, you know. And yeah. so in the um, in the zodiac, it has um, a list of planets. And they have a, a list of um, metals that are associated with them. And when I looked at them, I was like, the sun is gold, um, moon is silver, mercury is mercury, and, and those sort of things. Um, and the list goes down to um, lead, which is um, Saturn. What I know, I, I basically said, well, why are they actually metals, for one, and then you know, why are they in this order? And so I basically got on Google and s searched it. I said, well, why, what, I, look at these um, metal listings. And then I've, I've basically found one that was, had this, um, the same sort of layout or the same um, progression that was in the Zodiac. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's really interesting um, that they've put them in some sort of order and it relates relates to um, what's called a galvanic series. And this is um, you put two different metals in a battery sort of setup or a galvanic cell, and you're going to see which one acts as the anode and which one acts as the cathode. Sorry, Luke, to interrupt. Uh, is it just are you able to zoom in a little bit at all on what you have? There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay hugely interesting to me as an alchemist as well what you're talking about right now uh, i'll let you continue and then bring up some amazing things i've discovered with the metals and the heavenly bodies sweet um yeah so basically you've got a range these these metals that were depicted in the zodiac were a range from anode to cathode so most anodic to most cathodic and the sun being gold was the most cathodic metal and so at this stage i didn't and even know what a galvanic cell it means that it acts as a, Sorry, a the um, cathode's the part that wears, that wears away the anode's what wears away the cathode uh okay. anode wears what, away the cathode um comments. actually can grab mass Hundred okay. percent. Um, it's reversed in electrolysis. Um, so, oh, okay, yeah, that's uh, uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. It, there's a little funny thing. It, it's really, um, it's a bit of a trick, but it's it's there on purpose that you have electrolysis and you have a battery. One puts out energy, and one you're putting in energy. So the polarities flip, and that's why it's a little bit confusing. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay. yeah, in, in electrolysis, these two would flip, and one would be positive, one would be negative. So, and at this stage, when I was looking at this, I didn't even know what a galvanic cell was. You know, I knew what a battery was, but I didn't know like these terminology for it. So I started looking into it, <clears throat> and I'm had been on holidays. And I'm coming across on the spirit of Tasmania, sitting on the on a big boat, and I'm looking at into the galvanic series and the galvanic cell. And when I started putting this to um, into the sort of sun, these four element type things that's in the Zodiac as well, because it has the, the four elements, which is basically um, earth, water, air, and fire. Right? It has those four elements that are in, embedded into the Zodiac. So, you know, the sun is related to uh, fire um, and those sort of things. Earth is earth and those sort of things as well. So what I did was um, started putting this, these, uh, the galvanic cell into the um, four elements. And as I was sitting on this ship, um, I just noticed that the ocean's all around me and I'm reading about electrolytes and it was basically salt water. And I'm like, oh, Holy shit, you know. <laughs> I, I, 
you know, the, the very uh, thing that's needed to create a battery is this um, electrolyte. And I'm just sitting on it, you know, from everywhere I could see was ocean. I'm like, yeah, okay. It sort of um, hit home a little bit more real. <clears throat> um, so there's it, there's it, you know, progression. Just a di disclaimer, of course, this is just a model. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about it, a lot of, you know, just presenting what I've found. So, yeah. So let's let's get into the basic premise here. Um, you got the toroidal field. You got the the inertial plane there, or the um, this would be like the the positive and the negative of a um, magnet. And then you've got the this this yep. center tree, basically the center pillar, and then the sun and the moon are both uh, equal in size, moving around each other. Um, I think there's a lot, it goes around, uh, down a lot deeper than what we're actually told as well. So I think it's more to this toroidal sort of uh, field, if you like, uh, and a closed system. Obviously, within this enclosed system, we have a bunch of different sort of, um, so, uh, well, they, they're just polarities really at play. Um, and once once you start to put it into place, then you'll see that these um, pressures and and all these different things start uh, coming in. And so you know when you have looking at the the anode and cathode as the sun and the moon, then you're getting um, changes in temperature, changes in resistance, voltage. Um, you know, ones to do with heat, ones to do with cold, um, and this also has an effect on different salts. Um, different charge potentials, pressure potentials, um, and all those sort of things are at play. So um, this also relates to our downward neutral. Um, in a sense, just a, again, it's basically polarity at play again, um, where you have a positive material and a negative material that come together and they basically become uh, neutral. And so this is where your density and buoyancy all come into play um, because of neutrality. So I'll just briefly go over these um, and just to set it up and then we'll go into the, more of the galvanic cell and how it applies. So the galvanic cell is um, a, a fairly simple setup. It basically has, uh, you could split it down the mirror. It's like, it's like a... Um, you can, it's like a mirror. So one is the positive side, one is the negative side. You'll have two different metals um, and you'll have two different electrolytes and they are able to move through this permeable bridge or a porous membrane. And so and that porous membrane is what actually limits the, the battery from going to equilibrium really quickly and losing all potential charge. So when you start to put this galvanic cell uh, into our world, what actually happens is you have the four components again. You have the, the salt bridge or that permeable membrane, which is uh, the earth. And then you have the electrolytes, which is the oceans. And then you have uh, an anode, which is the moon, and the cathode, which is the sun. And so that, that is the basic uh, four element structure of it. Um, and from there, you can add multiple batteries into it. It's not just one. Uh, there's multiple layers to this and they sort of overlap on each other. Um, so this is basic structure of a battery, but it's also can be applied to our world in that way. So earth, water, air and fire. Next what was really interesting to me when I was researching this is that within the galvanic cell, they have sulfates, salt, and um, you join them together with water and you get electrolyte or water. Okay, so in the alchemical model as well, they'll have the four elements and then they'll have um, the three substances. And so you have sulfur, salt, and mercury, and they are the three main chemicals, if you like, um, that you need to get the, 
the battery working. Um, so mercury in this state, in this case, is more like a water and rather than the metal. Um, we can talk about the metal later, but it's it's interesting. They sort of cross over because of some of the attributes. But um, mercury in this case is more to do with an electrolyte. And you have the same principle or mercury, in a, if you like, electrolytes in your spinal cord, in your cerebrum, uh, in your cells where you have, you know, potassium and um you know your, your salts and your potassiums um, working to create charge in your body so this is not just a applicable to say the world or a battery or whatever but it's actually applicable to our uh, physiology which is an important aspect i think because it helps um make the the whole thing a bit more valid um so the basic idea is this uh there is a circulating uh, energy if you like and it really is driven by the sun um but it's fed by the moon which is you can't there's no independent sort of mechanism here there's nothing just sitting there doing its own thing it's all linked um, and that's something that's um, really i found really amazing with the, with this is that it turns into a holistic view rather than saying well the sun's there or the moon's there doing its own thing no they're, they're working together um you know in their own way doing different things that and this those two polarities have uh really certain jo you know different jobs so one of the biggest problems with so the, the, the yep sorry i was just going to say is it is the moon drawing energy and then feeding the sun because we know that moonlight's cold right it's like it's it's like it's taking stuff out of the atmosphere and then the sun's like it's giving it back because you were talking before about the electrolysis right you've got an input and an output yep yeah so um that's right so the the, the moon is giving to the sun in this model um because that's what the anode okay, does and that, the, and that can go the circuit well. goes one way yeah, exactly and, and then we have like our uh, phases of the moon where it literally wears away right over a month yeah and that's to do with sort of where it positions there's a lot going on in in terms of positions as well that that make those sort of things um happen and yeah there is also atmospheric electrolysis which i'll get into as well which is which is pretty interesting of how the planets can be created via electrolysis um, just energy moving by itself and that that actually refines metals um, but the the biggest problem i had right at the start of this was like well um, if you look back here the anode and cathode are actually in the electrolyte um, so you need that electrolyte to create the transfer between the two right so uh, well we don't see that in our world um that's it's sort of like i was like oh that's a big problem um so i had to well i basically came across this guy called um, george s pickett and he was levitating metal balls using um uh high voltage so he'd create in his own static machine and and whatnot but he was um he was looking for interplanetary communication a way of communicating and within this article it had and this was in the 19 i don't know it was 1900 sometime but he, he was going on about all the different effects and he was basically studying these these balls as they were levitating and you know he noticed things like if you heat it up it would have a different oscillation and um those sort of things would would occur and so it sort of had this um one-to-one -one match um between well it, the metal planets or explained in a way how the the metal planets could be um up there and levitating and i was like oh well that makes sense there's so, more to it there's more methods of levitation than this um that are at play but yeah there's about three or four when you say metal metal planets what do you mean that's just what 
because they don't mean that they're metal spheres, do you? Um, like, yeah, that's what, what are I we mean. Talking frequency here, or that you, you mean? They're no, metal I think they're spheres? metal. Yeah, physical. The, the planet. Yeah, that's right. You think they're actual metal? Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Wow. Yeah, so okay. it's it's a okay. So and the mo so model can't really work unless you have some sort of physicality to it. And there's a good reason why, because if you have a plasma or something like that, it's not going to just sit in the one spot and yep. do this repetition movement. He's going to want to return to equilibrium at some point. So okay. it's just a nature of energy. You have to have something that it wants to adhere to. And you'll see that like, if you look for somewhere where they're trying to create plasma, say just in the air with nothing, they are always got some sort of input for one and they are always got metal involved in some fashion. And there's a reason yeah. why this, why this is easily produced via electrolysis and it's all in the oceans. Anyway, it's getting lifted up. These elementals are getting lifted up out of the oceans by the heat of the sun. So it's not like it's they're getting it from somewhere and that's actually getting refined via a, a decent process. And then there's just energy okay. or voltage right. that is actually um, able to levitate as well as um, a few other other things at play that help with this process. So have you have you've obviously seen the the like Nikon P one thousand close ups of planets and stuff? What do you think we're looking at yeah. there? Have you seen those? So I, I have to interject on that one first off, and that is a straight up uh, artifact problem call, caused by digital uh, zoom and the the digital like interference, where when you look through like an analog. Uh, application or like a Man. telescope uh and actually like Man. i've got a pretty giant telescope myself that uh, i built as a child with my dad uh you never have that issue of it um looking like that and when you actually are able to focus in on the planets you will see uh what they are imaged as uh, or what uh, they claim they look like as opposed to what they turn out on these digital camera zooms. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, I can show you some, I think I've got a picture in here where it shows metal and um, the oxidizing effect on metal. And you'll see it's very similar to the moon. Exactly. You can't really tell the difference. Um, I said, I don't know if I've got like it. The there we, yeah, there yeah. we go. There you go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's ox oxidization. Um, and then you've got other things like, uh, so basically, there's the pitting and and this sort of white and the darkness. They they come from sulfates and and exactly what you see when the anode breaks down in in a in an air sort of environment a cold environment. dry environment different from you yeah, being in the wet but um so yeah i, I put that in because it, it is a sticking topic for you know for a lot of people um because it's sort of like mm -hmm. uh, i don't know it sort of reverts back to the old you know model that they've been balls, man. tried balls, tried to get away from it. it yeah i know and it sort yeah, of it upsets everyone but at the same time you sort of can't have if you want to have an energetic model or a battery model you've got to have some an anode and a cathode unless you can find a battery that sort of doesn't use those things um mm. you know you're gonna you, but there and, isn't and any. So, yeah yeah and with and, and so the planets are created as part of this process as part of uh, the galvanic cell basically and they're kept in orbits through what fields magnetic fields i'm guessing something like that yeah well it's it's uh, i i tend to think that we're in a closed system so when you have basically an yep. electric field obviously ma magnetic fields um but then you have um 
the the structure or the enclosed system um I think it's solid oxygen or solid air. And it, the simple process is like okay. how do you create how do you create a dome or an enclosed system without actually, you know, um building some some sort of scaffold. That's and what the, 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 mm. You've seen sky ice, yeah? Yeah. Sky uh, ice. I think there's some a bit of a red they, herring they, they've looked involved into that, in that. Say it's they could be, but they do say it's just oxygen and they're not sure how, how it forms a solid thing, but there's nothing in there but oxygen. Yeah. So um, basically when you when you get the temperatures down low enough, the air turns into a, a solid paramagnetic, um, this crystallised structure. Uh, and it... What it, what's super interesting about it is it's like it's a superconductor for one, so it's reflective of every energy that comes in. So it's almost like a pure shell, you know, pure reflection, and um, you know, it's got that tr crystallized structure. Uh, it, it's got all these properties that make it um, really interesting. But it, it also is able to levitate um, metals. And they just go around and loop. <laughs> they it's, it, they never stop because there's no friction. I don't know if you ever seen the videos. I'll have to send them to you. I haven't got them. I yet, would but... absolutely love to see that. Like, yeah, they get... I, I'm loving every bit of uh, your presentation so far. It's like so much connected into my alchemy, which is electrolysis that I do. Uh, you, I, I'm, listen, I'm listening to everything excited. you're saying. If I'm you not in front away. of the camera necessarily, it's because I'm setting up a couple things behind uh, the scenes to uh, show uh, once you're done. So please wait. You had to show your own electrolysis, didn't you, Bert? Ran off, got another camera. Gosh. <laughs> So the other battery that's involved um, is just a little bit different, and this is called a thermogalvanic battery. And it's just a different... It, the difference in it is that it only needs um, one type of electrolyte. It doesn't need a salt bridge. Um, and all you need is a heat differential. And so you, you say, well, the, even if the moon isn't as cold as what they say or it's not, you know, you know shooting out ice... But it's just got to have a differential uh, difference between the moon and the sun. And you're going to get an energy transfer as long as there's able to be an electric current moving across that space between it. So it's it's fairly simple. You will have that that's anode and cathode again. You're going to have a transfer of energy. Um, so... <laughs> that is sort of two. That's that's two on top of um on top of each other. So you have the galvanic and the thermogalvanic at play. You also have the the flow battery. We might get into that later, but um, you basically at the uh, hot side or the sun side, you've got an exothermic reaction happening, um, and you've got an endothermic reaction happening at the uh, cold side. This is to do with so the, that's how it's the, working without without the electrolyte is heat basically heat differential. Yeah, it still needs a tr communication through there, and the electrolyte comes basically from the heat of the sun. Um, it's it's like a drain. Know, we'll get up. to it. In, we'll, yeah, we'll get to it. So the, so the basic I mean, communication I, that would mean that evaporation what they told us either right I'm, you know the whole evaporation cycle that we see you know in school of the water going up and clouds and coming down i guess yeah, that's yeah. some of it's of right but some of it's true. yeah they're not they're not talking yeah they're not including what's going up it's higher up. so obviously we need a transfer and i needed well i've, I've found something that was you know perfect example of this is uh vacuum tubes um, so vacuum tubes are, you'll have a... Oh, sorry, a, do you mind uh, zooming in on that a little bit? Which one? Me. Oh, sorry, I went to the wrong oh, one. That was yeah. the one. Uh, yeah, on the left side there. Perfect. You're amazing. So the 
a vacuum tube is similar to a light bulb for people that don't know. Um, but instead of having a wire between it, you have the, um, the anode and cath cathode are separated. And usually you'll have a little grate or something between it. But it's all enclosed and it's in a low pressure system. Kind of like a neon That's not like a neon light more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More exactly like a neon like light. Yep. So in that you'll have a gas and it's usually doped with something. Um, could be salts or whatever. Um, and it's the don't let the vacuum fool you. It's just low pressure. That's all it is. Um, you and they're used in old guitar amps and they were used instead of, um, uh, what was it? Basically, your little switches. So that that's your basic principle that's at play between the sun and the moon is you have a transference of electricity or energy uh, from the moon to the sun. And it's exactly like a vacuum tube. So it's, if you want to look at that, people want to look at that, they can. So as when you uh, overlay this um, battery, you basically have the cathode as the positive terminal, hydrogen production, because um, that's what the, the positive terminal does. It will produce hydrogen. Uh, it's exothermic, high current, high resistance, acidic accumulator. So it accumulates energy, uh, gold, it's most noble, plasma surface. Plasma is still involved, but you need metal to create plasma. So uh, we'll get to why the sunlight color it is. Um, negative terminal, oxygen production, endothermic, high voltage, low resistance, alkaline, um, transferee. It is uh, silver, second most noble, and it has more like ionic winds rather than a plasma. Um the water, this is, it's sort of, this is as above, so below type stuff where you have an upper atmospheric electrolyte and a lower um, lower electrolyte um, and one's in an aer aerated medium and one's in a liquid sort of uh, medium. So we can have a look at some of the um, stuff that's in salt water. Not only is it sort of like a uh, good for your sort of own blood, <laughs> but uh, it has chlorides, it has the sodiums, it has the sulfates, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. So these are the main ones for the battery that are in there. The the chloride, um, sulfate. It's also got gold in it. It's also got silver. It's got tons of stuff. Um, so there's a plenty of stuff so going on below. Oh, Did the know. clouds come into this process? No, I'm not sure. I think okay. clouds are like a plasma monoatomic. I'll cover that a little bit at the end too uh, when going over my Oh, my okay. So maybe they're produced. Yeah, okay. Like like when you did that experiment, you got all that stuff being just popped the ether into your jar. Yeah, right. Well, I thought they were more like, like a, Sorry, like a salt. And I knew that when they add um, sulfates to the clouds, that that will start to generate rain. So there is some sort of, uh, you know, like um, galvanic type process going on in there, electrochemical process. Anyway, um, I just popped this in into my presentation because I think it's really interesting um, to correlate some of this stuff with... Um, with the body and then that makes a it makes it really interesting um so this guy i won't speak too much on it but renee quinton he was um healing people with the use of seawater and basically he would go down and he would get um certain a certain type of seawater was like 30 feet down and he was just making sure it was basically clean and um he was able to basically put it straight into people's veins and um, they were healing from it. So the electrolytes or the salts and things that are needed for your body are directly can be directly pulled from the ocean. So I just uh, found this really interesting. You can do more uh, reading on it 
for people that are interested but um wow he people still so use it today like things. no you don't need it no nah. you just need ocean water no. and and he does he wow. it wasn't like straight ocean water obviously you have to get it in it's a diluted <laughs> form of it but, <laughs> but mm. this um this shows the connection because our body is electrochemical as well the heart produces a voltage as we know um and it's my mm -hmm. my theory that we have two different types of blood in a sense one's oxygenated one's not and they have your arterial yeah. and your yeah. ve red venous and or Which aries and venous the, blood the red blue shit yeah part. Mm. yeah and th when those two come together you see it in the flow battery um that when those two come together that's how you get a voltage and so the, the heart acts like the earth oh, like the oh, membrane oh. between it okay. oh okay so okay so yeah it's that's almost why like the heart is in polarities like yeah and yeah okay yeah exactly and there's uh, actually a battery that people should check out that's um it breathes it runs on oxygen and so the same sort of thing um so these can be correlated it's crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah no yeah basically but it's it's um yeah that's why there's like that anagram for earth and heart because they're like salt bridges between the two polarities yeah so the same thing i yeah both do the same thing and there is sort of this um pumping action that goes on with the thermohaline circulation um really interesting how the sun when the sun moves over the ocean it actually heats up the waters the waters expand and bring up the salts into it because that heated water can hold more salt than the cold water and so it does this cyclic movement it's, it's churning the salts at the same time it's moving around um so the haline this cycle is really interesting because it seems to have this differentiation between the internal and external and a movement between the internal and external and two different i think there's two different types of um salts going on there too which would be related to the potassium nitrates and the sodium chlorides um so the upper electrolytic gas is uh is is sort of recognized as the ionosphere and they do recognize like a global circuit they call it and those sort of things um uh, but yeah they yeah, they sort of say I mean, there's so a like so a... sodium layer layer and those sort of things yeah and, and the oceans move almost like our blood like some of them are like it polarizes itself basically we've got two circuits going yeah, I think so. And I think that's because of like, I think it's this heat and cold and heat differential type stuff happening again, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. All right. Um, quickly, I want to say a big thank you to Andrew and US Reset for your support. We, we appreciate it very much, Lee. Oh, that's better. Sorry. Oh, there that. we I go. Do that. <laughs> well, yeah. sorry. Oh, we figured it out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> halfway uh, through uh, rocking <laughs> yeah so this is this one okay, i relate start, to the... now start again great okay. Oh, <laughs> okay so this one i relate to the atmospheric uh, uh the atmos atmospheric flow battery and basically um i relate this to the heart as well so this is what we're talking about you have tank one and tank two one's a blue one's a red <laughs> And then you have this membrane between, and this is where you get the voltage from the two tanks. So I think there's uh, a sort of same sort of similar thing going on here with the sun and the moon, you know, where you have one red, yeah. one blue polarity again. Um, mm. Oh, I did a picture for it. There you go. Boom. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah. And that, okay, so, yeah, nice. yeah, the capillaries seem to have the same sort of thing going on as well. Uh, for replication, um, earth capacitor. So in a galvanic cell, the, the earth, uh, well in the, 
salt bridge uh, acts, like I said, like a, a capacitor in a sense. It's holding charge and not, it's keeping the equilibrium between the two polarities. Um, so in this sense, I think the earth is acting as like a sink of energy as well. It's holding charge. Um, there's also this movement. You need sort of like a movement of ion exchange through the salt bridge. And so this is what I think a lot of these groundwaters um, and aquifers and that's about is actually this penetration of basically oceanic waters but it's accumulating and the other thing with the salt bridge is it basically brings together positive and negative and when you have that you lock you're locking these elements together in a sense um and so they accumulate you have another side to the earth uh salt bridge and that is molten salt or magma and this is another type of battery, which is a, uh, a molten salt battery uh, that holds charge as well. Really powerful. They just they basically can store a lot of energy for a long time. Um, and then all you have to do is heat them up and they're off and they're, they're um, producing again. And so these, this is what seems to be going on within. There's a lot of high current sort of transfer between these um, positive and not negative ions transferring and then you have this uh molten salt so so how many batteries are we up to about five batteries so far i don't know something like that yeah yeah, yeah something like that and then we have the stratification type stuff which is um basically when you have this stratus different st layers of earth that go down um it's like this one's just, I'm not 100% on this at, at all, but um, it seems reasonable enough that you have these layers of um, different plates and different metals or different contents of earth and they'll, they'll start holding a charge as well. So that's basically a volt, uh, voltaic pile, very simple battery. Yeah. Um, the growth of the salt bridge or earth is called electrocrystallization and it refers to basically crystal growth uh, using electrodes and electrochemical type processes so i'll flick through these we don't want to go on too long do we <laughs> there's telerate currents people can read up on telerate current induction in the earth um, for telephone wires and those sort of things how they transfer through the earth um, this relates to electroculture um, if people aren't familiar with what that is it's using electricity to actually increase crop growth um, there's been a fair few tests yes. on it and things like that and so there's mm. one in particular that i liked where he basically had um, wires in the ground and then wires above his crop and he would um do the polarity thing so he basically have one positive and one negative and he was getting good crop results and then he'd flip the polarity and it would, you know do all sorts of different things and upset things you know so i just found that interesting so it may relate there might be a correlation with that sort of setup and how the sun and the moon both affect us you know or plants and animals and cycles So this is your states of matter, basic states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. Um, uh, we won't worry about that too much. And this is your world distillation. This is what I was talking about earlier. Um, how the sun uh, heats the oceans and it, the world winds just uh, keep moving all that, circulating it around with pe pressure differential. And then you're creating basically an atmospheric electrolyte from that process. Um, and this is really interesting because it does relate extremely well to alchemy and what they were tr trying to do with the great work in a sense, um, because they're applying heat to a substance and then they're cooling it down. 
and they're, they're copying the world process in a sense and um, being involved mm -hmm. in it. And I, th I think that's really interesting that the alchemical side of, of this enclosed system. Obviously, world winds play a huge role in moving um, atmospheric elements and even at, evening out the electrolyte. Um, so this is one of the charts that a lot of alchemists uh, know. Uh, this is your basic uh, setup where you will have celestial salt and celestial nitre. Um, celestial nitre is, is more to the moon size or nitrates and then the sun side is more to your chlorides. Um, so it all fits in a battery sort of thing. Again, it's, it's very interesting how it did that. <laughs> uh, so this is, if I was using a silver anode and a gold cathode, how the process would actually occur uh, or, or the actual chemicals you would need to actually make a battery with those two metals. Um, and it's really, you need to be able to produce nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. And you produce uh, sodium, produce hydrochloric acid with sodium chloride and sulfuric acid. Um, and that'll produce that and then sulfuric acid and potassium nitrate and that'll create your nitric acids and interestingly enough when you join those two you get uh, aqua regia which is royal water and that's able to break down gold or interact with gold in the right way how does some of these elements get there into the atmosphere they get there via volcanoes um via the sulfates there's huge amounts of sulfates going up into the atmosphere via volcanoes there's also mercury going up into the into the atmosphere via uh, volcanoes huge amounts and it's not just like land one it's sea sea ones as well um so the sulfur in a plasma state that'll actually create the the same spectrum um as sunlight so everyone's gone <laughs> i'll keep going um the so as before the difference between the galvanic cell and the electrolysis is energy in and energy out so i think those two things are occurring because you're in a closed system so you have to have both operating at the same time um we spoke about that the reason the mercury kept coming up for me as a um sort of a sticking point because it was all in the it, it turns up everywhere. I'm and still it's, yelling because I didn't realize uh, Campbell stepped up for me. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm here and yes, yeah. you continue. It's amazing stuff you're doing. So uh, Mercury is one of those things that is um, just so, when you start looking at the metal itself, it's, it's just so interesting because of all its properties. Um, and the, the main thing it's able to do, which is interesting, is amalgamate metals. And people aren't really sure of what the uh, what that process is because they don't really think it's a chemical reaction as such. It's just pulling metals in. It's really, it's really cool to go and have a look at um, how mer mercury does that to gold and silver and all these other metals. Right. It has a real them kind of like water dissolves minerals and elements yeah exactly so it's it's got this sort of this why i was sort of um putting it in reference to our electrolytes as well so it has this sort of correspondence there like it's like another level up <laughs> if you know what i mean i feel exactly what you're saying right there i've thought i've had the same thoughts and ponderances on it for years yeah, it's like a, a different sort of um, dimension of water in a sense. Um, so it has a high surface temperature and it's liquid at room temperature. So these make it perfect for basically getting into a gaseous state and getting up into the atmosphere via the volcanoes. Now, why is it? It's also one of its uh, interesting things that it does is actually is used in um, old mercury arc valve reactors 
Now, this was... It's really good at catching signals. Obviously, Mercury is amazing at catching signals, but it's also able to transfer um, transfer alternating current, AC current, into DC current. So that's a really oh. interesting property that it's what able to do. Can. Right? As well as it doesn't uh, break down or erode, it uh, keeps replicating itself in this... Uh, plasma arc state it's very very fascinating yeah so, it's eternal i mean that's do you know of paul cook he um i think he was in malta and he found one of these in, in an old um movie theater yeah like an, a, a mercury did. arc rectifier yeah because they were using it for power and stuff yeah something light projection don't know yeah so <sighs> That, that was really interesting to me because the, the whole system seems to be built for DC rather than AC. Um, mm. So that's another special property of Mercury. We're on, we're on AC, aren't we? We're on alternate. Yeah, we're on AC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's something yes, dodgy are. going on there. Yeah. So the other thing is that um, they done a, an experiment where they would have like um, – two poles as a positive and negative and they put mercury in a um it was like a maze and it was able to find its way through the maze to get to the positive end because it, it has a tendency to move towards the cathode wow. and i just thought oh that's really interesting it's actually able to navigate around um which is just a really fascinating wow. property on its own so i read read some pretty interesting articles um the other one that's really important is that you're able to grow silver on mercury in nitrates and you're able to and they have wow. transferred um, mercury into gold um via high voltage so those Ooh, two dude, things you just figured it out there old chemical secret nearly <laughs> I mean, yeah, because uh, we talk about mercury a lot, right? And these mercury balls and stuff that we see. Too. Yeah, yeah, it, it transmutates. It's, it's well because it can turn AC into DC. Would would AC be what you would be picking up from like etheric energy if you were like drawing? Uh, other it from way around, from, DC is what you'd be picking you'd be up. Drawing DC, the whole... would you? Yeah, DC is okay. whatever. So, so okay. I'm just trying to work what the Mercury is doing, but I've always thought it was more of an amplifier or like a signal rectifier, if you want to put it that way, to sort of tune in the signal. But yeah, yeah, well, it does that too. It does. It has all these properties to it that is mm. just outstanding. Um, but yeah, and that's why mm. I think there's a process going on. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's one. But I think there's a process going on that it's it's when it goes up into atm the atmosphere, um, it's actually accumulating metals in a sense. It's pulling metals towards itself. It's got a high surface tension, so it's um, it's a, a spherical in nature. And it's also then you've got the other processes of electrolysis that are actually going to start refining it. And then you've got the salts that are up there that where crystals can grow and all these sort of things. But in general, once you add mercury mm. to it, it gives another secondary layer of how metals can actually form up there, um, which is, mm. I just find really fascinating. Well, well, of Mercury's course, it's only, just a model, but, you know. Because mercury is the only metal that, that makes amalgams, right? That will literally eat another metal and like combine with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At room temperature, yes. So, yeah. Uh, the boundary, the air so dome, does, I think this is... So does that look oh. like the old world was, was DC then? Correct. Is, is that what you're, you're, you're coming out of that? Like it was a DC that, that was being given out as, as the energy source? Mm. Because we're told that, you know, DC, right, that's that's the devil. You know, you touch it and you get electrocuted and die pretty much. That's what the whole Edison, you know, Tesla thing was about, right? And then electrocuting the elephants and all this kind of stuff. I think that 
Well, this is obviously getting an AC um, into it. It has to get an AC because you're rectifying it. So it's it's being used to say charge a you know whatever the electric yeah. vehicles or do something in DC. So it has to be deriving the energy as yeah. AC. But to to your sort of um, point, I do think oh, that they um, have obfuscated how far they can actually push dc through telephone or the the power poles and those sort of things i think they can go much further and much more efficient mm. than well, that was being told that was a big controversy wasn't it is um west westinghouse edison ed was going to have to build yeah like stations every couple of kilometers or whatever to get his power grid up yeah yeah, well, that's right. That's what they were saying. But I've mm. read articles where the, it's not that in that case either. Um, so right. I don't it's know. Cool, it's right. all dodgy. And, and it's so all dodgy when you go back. No. Very dodgy. I agree. With these rectifiers, are they being fed power or are they drawing power? Like are they their own power source and then feeding or are they part of like a grid that's being fed in and then they're rectifying the power and feeding the machine? Yeah, they, they're getting energy. So that, and then they're rectifying that energy into DC, so we're usable for a different application. So I don't know how old these actually are. Like they might not be as old as what what we're told, but they're, um, you know, mm. they are interesting well, and they're just um, fascinating. We've got photos of them. Mm, we've got photos of them charging electric cars back in uh, the twenties, yeah. I think. 100 years ago not that long ago but it's interesting stuff isn't it? i mean the more we get into this it's like the world that you know just 100 years ago was completely different to what they tell us <laughs> these have got mercury buddy rectifiers and stuff and and we're told everyone was just living in the mud in a buggy you know in a buck hut yeah exactly oh they had an understanding i mean those those uh even the valve tubes and all those sort of things are pretty Pretty amazing the way they created them. Um, mm. So I think we're nearly at the yeah, end here. Uh, here's a question. Yeah. Have, have you heard of red mercury? And, and, and is that, oh, sorry, is my sound low? Someone said my sound. Sorry. Um, red mercury, have you seen that where there's videos that show that it um, is repelled by garlic and attracted to gold? Is that correct? Or is it, yeah, that's right. Right. Um, have you seen that? Yeah, I've heard of it. I don't, I don't know. know if it's I think it seems like, like I, I think it's like dodgy. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, the mirror tricks and shit. Vampire, yeah. Part, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, the, the attractive to gold. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know what the properties of red mercury are, but you know, mercury would be attracted to gold, wouldn't it? Because it would try and eat it. Is that right? Yeah, I suppose. Right, but that, um, that, that it is negative charge. Yeah. Uh. I don't know. You'd have to do testing, but it, like it's, what I'm saying is, it's if the test, the gold I'm, is the cathode, then um, it'll it'll be attracted yeah. to the positive of that. So, yeah, but yeah. maybe just not on its own. So, if someone can know. just send us in some red mercury, um, we'll we'll get some we'll test experiments it. going. <laughs> get some yeah, garlic we'll out. Um, yeah, man. Okay, so oh, that's oh, we're nearly at the end. Um, this ties into something that I find fascinating. Oh, I built one of these engines, or I modified an engine to run on plasma. And since we're talking about plasmas as sort of like the, the sun, then it really only requires three things. Um, it requires a magnetic field, uh, low pressure, and heat. You know, so those three things. Once you got them going. Um, you know, there, there's all the recipe for creating a, a plasma, p pumping it up into that next state. And so this this is a GEET engine, GEET reactor. And so you can do the same thing. It's basically got a spinning metal rod through the intake. Um, as the pr as the piston comes down and the of the the of the engine, it's creating a low pressure uh, system. And it's obviously got the the exhaust from the engine coming around the outside, so it's got the heat. And so you've got these three things, and you're actually uh, creating a plasma. 
so these guys, you know, when if you see these uh, engines where people have modified them, they run them on freaking coffee and just crazy stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I built one of these, and it, it worked wonderfully. So um, just just those principles are at play in the higher atmosphere, and so this makes it well, yeah, super efficient, super. Uh, awesome and that's about all i've got on the electric flat earth presentation ah don't stop there's so much goodness um i i do need a couple more minutes though to get ready uh a little bit of a live demonstration i'd like to show you that correlates exactly to uh what you've been talking about um Sorry. Have you seen, I disagree. Um, there's a Feminazi Slayer. Uh, alchemy is, me, is both science, alchemy. but uh, there, there is some, I guess, magic or spiritual uh, sides to the alchemy or act more than uh, the science of it, uh, essentially, or I guess more than electrical well, and magnetic energy well you know, break, you break energy. apart the when you, when you break don't understand technology, it's all magic yeah break apart the word alchemy as well you, know, you got l and chemi yeah. it's it's right. if you say instead chemi of chemi l it's chemi l chemi yeah it's electrochemistry the words out of my mouth Lucas, I've been going around chemistry. for years. It's electrochemistry, electric chemistry, and more so electrolysis chemistry is the science of alchemy. Yeah, yeah, mm. 100%. And, and the other thing to say about that is, you know, they do this all the time, right? All the time with information that is empowering, that is truth. They put it out there. They don't tell you, but they put it out in movies and they put out the conspiracy theories that it's all evil and bad, and then you won't look at it. I mean, well, and, and there the is, a, is a, information should information should never be scary. If it's crap, you just discard it. I mean, this is the thing because you read something about black magic doesn't mean you're going to turn into a a black magician and start and killing it, people. You know, it's just exactly. And it's does. also all intent too. But there is some uh, yes. extremely powerful um, and yeah, I guess more negative people used it for dark magic as opposed to light magic uh like spell stuff and um i guess craft you'd call it uh, a craft of alchemy um within that you can summon things but that goes more into the occultic witch wiccan and uh wizard sides of um studies than what i do on the scientific side of alchemy and its history there is a, a highly there sort of you want to make spiritual your home, throw some grapes in a microwave sorry <laughs> um apparently that makes so there's, there's this <laughs> i don't know there's um <laughs> there's a spiritual component to this as well when you start looking into polarity especially and um you know just polarity isn't just polarity when you look at it really it is actually a trinity because you have one side and then the opposite side yes. and then you have to have a communication between them so it's that overlap that communication between them is really where the energy sort of comes from and that's um it starts to build a bigger p picture of our cosmology as well in a sense that uh a lot of these ideas about uh, that m middle ground, that middle way, and all those references, you know, like the Buddha or the Jesus or whatever it is you the want to follow, path. the middle path, um, mm. the way between extremes starts to come into play because you're not hyper-focused on the sun or the moon side of yourself. You're sort of being that central pillar. Yeah. And um, so the, there is a, a highly spiritual, you know, uh, connection that runs from mm. this battery model into um, a lot of the uh, religious texts or just religious understandings, I guess, philosophies. Well, we've been polarised, right? 
that they, they've pretty much told us there's only positive and negative, right? But um, okay, don't go anywhere. Need five minutes on. to get some things let's, to let's you. Let's put a third right landing on it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Mark, Marco Roden, I'm sure you've seen his work, um, put the third winding on it, right, which is the ether. Right? That, that, mm. and, and that's the problem with, with science today is they don't acknowledge the ether. And so this is why there's so many, you know, problems and, and they need their, their you know, equations that, you know, are like 50 characters long and stuff to explain what they're talking about because they're missing one of the main components and they won't admit that it exists. Well, source, it's so, sort of sort of funny because, like, um, it's ether is somewhat misdescribed in a lot of ways, and um, I think when when you look at my model, in a sense, there's I don't call them, really should call it my model. It's just battery model, but um, it's the ether in this sense is the electrolyte. Um, but there could be other things. Okay. We know that there's a, there's okay, an so exchange of men. Yeah. We know there's a mental exchange that goes on as well in our world. It's not just um, you know pure you know physicalness. There's this polarity that seems to be occurring as well, which I found and it helped me understand a lot of the um, symbolism in our world as well, which was this polarity between mind and matter. And if you change the the letter of um, mind and you flip the M, you get wind. And then when you have um, material and you flip the, the M again, you get water. So you have this wind-water dynamic. And that's actually in the alchemical chart. You can see that's a mercury-type construct. Um, but... Okay. So you have this polarity and so a lot of the, um, when you see wings and anything to do with air, it's a reference to the mind and anything to do with um, water and those uh, motherly sort of stuff as well, you get a reference to um, to this matter, material. And there's no distinction because they're really both sides of the same coin, just like the sun and the moon are sort of separate, but they're working together. So the the mind and the matter in us is is again working together in complete harmony or wants to be at least. And so when we're looking at some of the um, mythological and, and these type of constructs out there, uh, I think it's important that people understand that whenever you see something to do with air and head and above, it's all to do with mind anything below it's to do with matter material matrix mother and those sort of things yeah yeah and i mean that's almost like manifestation isn't it you know we have to use the the mind to bring things into the physical right yeah 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 and there's there's so much to be said about just um really focusing on and honing in on polarity and and some of the stuff that actually um presents itself from that and a lot of these um stories that we hear in mythological tales and um are actually to do with uh how the world operates and in in a sense you have this uh world tree in the center and this is this axis between yeah, the yigrisil. mind and the matter yeah well yggdrasil is okay. actually um two words it's to do with uh, odin and horses and horses play a role uh, in a lot in mythology because they're the power behind the movement and they're the hours, yeah, horses and hours and Horace and all that link up. Ah, I'm just, I'm just Sorry, I'm into like dark elves and dwarves and all this stuff and um, and, and dark elves are the, the origin of nightmares and the horses, man, these bloody horses, they're all around the elves. What's, what's the deal? Well, yeah, horses um, is basically, in a sense, it's related to the Horai as well, um, which are the three, three, three fates, and they water um, the, the tree of, uh, they watered the world tree. And it's a reference, in a sense, to the three okay. seasons and three geometric means. And so what they're, what they're sort of referencing there is the, the time itself, 
And so you have this idea that uh, the world tree is like the still point, the unmovable within the moving. So it's the eye of the storm, if you like. Okay, yeah. But yeah, 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 so the, it's the, the, it's the time, yeah. it's the pivot point and it's the timeless aspect of our world because it doesn't move. It's, it's really not, um, move. it's not in that c- cyclic. Wow. And so there, there you have this um, polarity yeah. going on between the world of change and the world of timelessness. And so this is why you get okay. these sort of references back in, everything goes back into the world tree and we all do as well. Mm. And what's what's actually occurred because we've had a cosmology that's been um, messed with is that um, the, the symbolism has been messed up and it's basically because when you have a heliocentric viewpoint, the sun is at the centre of the, the solar system, right? And everything yes, is yeah, to do yeah. with the sun and the sun becomes the immovable in a sense. But it wasn't actually the sun. Oh, it was okay. originally just a invisible, in a sense, world tree that the sun and the moon moved around, and it was related to the stars yeah. or the or the polaris, like the right? They tell us about. It's mm. the axis that they the sun and the moon it. move it, it, around. It's on twenty. Mm. So whenever you see a lot of they, you re- when you see the mythologies in um, or Wikipedia and things like that, and they say this is the sun god, it's nearly always not a sun god. It's to do with the world axis. And you'll have Apollo, um, Zeus, Mercury, all these different ones that are Apollo. actually in the in the centre. Apollo. Apollo. Yeah, mm. Apollo. Yeah. Apollo. And, uh, and Abraxas, Apollo. which wow. is the, the axis. And so a lot of the, the once you put that, yeah, yeah, a praxis, yeah. So once you get that into your, sort of oh. into your psychic, psy, psyche of how that's operating and it, it's almost the symbol for the sun is, is really like uh, it's been exchanged for this because it was originally that monad picture which was a circle with a dot in the centre. And they say it's a sun symbol, but it's actually yes, a monad. Yeah, yeah. But the the central point is the um, is the world axis. And so all of these solar system solar symbols that what they say their solar sy- symbols are actually not what they say. And so uh, okay. yeah. That's so, that's. I'm just trying to help people when they start looking at mythology, how the construct yeah. has been played against us. So it's like it's like the realm with the pole in the middle of it. I mean, this is the thing, uh, and that's what they do, right? With spelling. All they need to do is change, you know, what they tell us the meaning of a word is or whatever, and and we go on, right? We have no idea what's going on because uh, everything symbols, and this is what we find all over the buildings, right? They used to be covered in this language of symbols and. And, and they taught us to write in letters, right? Yeah, well, they have a lot of symbols. Um, it's this. amazing. Um, let me bring up some stuff here. I mean, just that's all fun. they use. I mean, you just look at all the signs and that for, you know, hazardous waste. Everything's a sign or a symbol. And, of course, on computers now we have all these little symbols that we call icons. Icon is an interesting word as well. Uh, hold on, I just have to. Um, concrete mason. Oh. Um, so, is that showing? All right. Well, um, are you sharing screen? Oh, hang on, I've got to do it. There, now it is. I'll just show you some of the encodings and stuff. I'll get out of this one. Why won't it let me move? So you see this in old maps and things like that where they have this. um, This is the monad pretty much, and it has the 32 rays around the 33rd point. But you can see here in the old maps that they're using this as a a methodology for actually mapping. Um, Really, really interesting. 
so some of the stuff that they say with these numbers are, are just complete rubbish they're just trying to be uh you know keep people down mm -hmm. and hold them back mm -hmm. from understanding what's going on and especially when you're doing sort of yeah, navigation right. and things like that so you know 666 and people you know get all upset about it and stuff but um you know this is the the minute divisions of the circle and um it's yeah you know it's related to the nautical mile and stuff so that they they're so, trying to you know hide this information that's about our realm and how all these systems of measurement actually come into play and they're actually built off um music um which is really important because when you're measuring yeah. out the the cathedrals and things like that if you have a system of harmonics that you can work off then you know it's going to be musically aligned and so this is 27 mm. mile 27 league 20 and you will see that they have these harmonics and you can see this number oh, here is related to to the procession of the equinox and things like yeah. that but they're actually just harmonics of number um Mm, yeah, and they're all nine numbers too. Well, you can see that some of these nine numbers are actually the God number, right? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of the infinite. Um, it's the last one. Mm. It's a serpent as well. Um, so you can see that some oh. of these numbers are actually inbuilt into our hand as well. So the mathematics of the hand shows some of this uh these, you know, frequencies four, three, four, two, three, two, or two. eight. Yeah, Which course, and that's just a different way of different way of calculating your your hand, but um, just mm. you'll you'll well, see I mean, a, a number of things. One thing that they've they've really got us with all they teach us is um I, I call it accounting mathematics. Like literally, it's just how to how to do maths for money, right? That's all they teach you at school. They don't teach you any of this interesting stuff. Oh no, there's a whole world out there of of really and, really interesting mathematics and, and it's really system, i mean yeah i was just going to say how do you see it i see it as like 10 see we're, we're taught that 10 is like the end of the first you know group of 10 where it's actually the first of the next set isn't it like zero is the first number so zero to nine are the first 10 numbers and then 10 is clearly it's one right one and zero which goes up yeah, to yeah so it's, equals it's, 10. And we, Go well, two. it's um, so, so you we, go zero to nine. At that's ten well. digits. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you can do it a exactly. number of different yeah, ways. Yeah. But they take you from one to ten. Yeah. And then there's something really interesting that happens yeah. with triangular triangular numbers um, and those sort of things. And you can see there's the um, 364 day calendar sort of built into triangular numbers, which is really fascinating as well. I'm actually building an app um, and hopefully be released soon that's um, going to have a conversion between the 364 day calendar and the 365 oh, day calendar and it'll have yeah. a clock and stuff on it so what's the 13 13 is that is that going to be oh, oh i'm just having it as counting sign, it? yeah it actually where okay. i started i started exactly. the I started the day, um, the start of the year for this uh, on the app. We'll start at uh, the first of April, and I did it there because it actually oh, the way okay. it divides the sky, and it will only have one division of one of the star signs, and that will be in. It'll split um, basically uh, Scorpio into two, but if I had it in different spot, it would wouldn't split the sky properly. Um, so more, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you could always add like Luke Ember as a new month. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not adding my own month. Oh, yeah. I just added a numbers. <laughs> so. <laughs> Shit. It's a bit that's it. But uh we, we so could this all is... like we could all yeah like worship you for a month every year. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. No thanks. <laughs> um so this one was a, is an interesting one if you want to get back to the horses and that ah, and your anagram for heroes. horses yeah, is nice. is heroes. And then you take the heroes. H off it, you get Eros, Ooh. which is love and desire. And so um there's a ah. lot to go into with and horse Mar symbolism. Mary is um ocean, isn't it? Mary's ocean yeah, yeah. in uh, French, is it? Mm. Yeah, Mar Marina is is to do with the oceans, and yeah, Mary. Oh, wow. Marina. Yes. And 
Yeah, yeah. 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 So, Mac and ba- and backwards, it's it's um, yeah. or you can make Mara is an anagram for Rama, and so that you're sort of making the Hindu god then, you know. So it all ties in, and this is Kama yeah. or Kama uh, related to the Buddha's mother. But it's a, it's a deep rabbit hole that I've, I'm doing a lot of research on. Well, even when they talk about the apocalypse in the Bible, they mention horses, don't they? Is it the, yeah, the horses of the apocalypse or something? Is that right? No, yeah, well, horses, the horses, the horsemen, that's it. Yep. Well, they're the seasons because you, you take yeah. horse is, is horror in Spanish and it means hours. So it's a designation Horus, for yeah, time, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is Horus, which relates back to Jupiter and all those sort of characters which are part of this winged god. But um, w- what what you find is that they're just relating things to time and so as well as power, like horsepower. And so when you see the chariots pulling yes. the, the sun and the moon, well, that's the hours and and power behind things and it actually stands for a type of law that's embedded into it as well a type of logo so divine timing so um there's a lot to it but um anyways just for people to go down that rabbit hole if they feel i mean what what they want to this looks very tower of babel doesn't it like there was this language, but it wasn't like language like we think of language. It wasn't like letters and spelling and all this. It was like an understanding of symbols and symbolism, you know, all this. Like it's like, you know, um, like the Facebook symbol, you know, the blue, a white F in a blue square does not mean Facebook. It means yeah, a billion things, right? Somewhere you can talk when you can post it. So that's what which was where we've been taught that a word is just you know we're looking at i mean we're like infants we look at a word like walk oh that means to move your legs and that's all it means right like but their symbols like encode so much information that that, and i think this is what the buildings were you could stand outside a building and read it i think and it would tell you what you know what was going on what the building did and all this kind of stuff and wow that's um, yeah it's really interesting because (laughs) That what gets me about the old world buildings. They have nothing on them, no advertising. No, they've all just, been stripped. Yeah. Okay. Mm. A facade has been put on. The further back you go, the more they've got. But it, yeah, it's all oh, like oh, proper. Oh. Like it's all the statues and the the faceting and all that. Yeah. I'll but quickly yeah, show you where time. that where that sure. horse symbolism actually comes from and how it relates to the zodiac. Just um, bring up that slide quickly go through this so it actually comes from the threshing floor so this is an old farming practice um, and it's basically where they would um, get the wheat from the harvest and they'd bring it onto the floor and they'd walk an animal around in a circle and there'd usually be a central pillar of that circle that would uh, be tied to the animals to keep them going in a circle Sometimes they'd have a, a sled or something, and what it would do would actually crush um, the grain up and or crush the the stalks up and release the the grain onto the ground. So then you could collect it and put it in a mill. So this movement of animals walking around in a circle is what the zodiac is actually based off, because zodiac is zoo dial. It's it's a animal circle. Oh, it, it's go. it's actually yeah, it's two words, and so this animal, yeah. place was usually found high up where you'd have more wind, so you could actually get rid of the the chaff from the wheat, and um, in this central pillar in the center of it um, became like a sundial, right? And it's also a symbol for our world, like I was showing with the monad. And so it started to tell the time. Um, it was known as the the gnomon, which means knowing one. So the the animals acted like the shadow of a sundial, right? So they were actually the ones moving everything around. They were moving the seasons. So you see the analogy that's that's sort of taking place between the the movement mm-hmm. of the heavens and. Um, and this, and the idea of the ox or the horse. 
And so Polaris is this central mm. point that they're moving around. And you can see that horse and hours, you take out the vowels, um, take out the vowels and you'll get hours, you'll get hori and all the rest of it. So the hori were goddesses of the seasons and natural portions of time. So you're getting this whole story that starts to come out of it uh, from this understanding here. It makes me think of all the animals that were walking in circles recently. <laughs> well, that's what they need to do. Well, I don't know. Changing of ages, I don't know. So Maybe they just want this... some some wheat to eat. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, just tell me to stop whenever, because I can just keep going. Yes. No, no. If you're good, you keep going. Okay. Um, I've got okay, to deliver meals. <laughs> I've got to deliver meals soon, so I'll, I'll have to nick off in a bit. But um, okay. so this central pillar is sometimes called the Omphalos stone. And this, you know, relates to your, what they call them, obelisks and really? things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Right? I thought you were talking about someone else in the phallus stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's Sorry, a guys. actually Keep it's playing. a joining of of two, um, because you're joining the heaven and the earth, right, with that on phallus, oh. and so you're joining the masculine and the feminine oh. together, and that's where you yeah, get yeah. hermaphroditic, right? You get the two two polarities coming together, and how are the polarities created? The created out of the vesica. And it's this vesica that starts to yes, create yes, the, yes. the, the yes, net. Yes. Yeah. And this is a net mm. that sits over the omphalos yeah, stone. Mm. And most of the uh, um, omphalos stones or the obelisks are, are literally sitting on top of a vesica Pisces symbol. Yes. And so and everyone this... thinks it's all about sex, but, but clearly, again, it's it, there's more going on there, right? It's not just about trying to symbolise a, a, you know, no, Man's no, no. In, in, bits. No, no. It's it's symbolizing. It's a creation story because this is how you cre you can show something as created via geometry. So, and these are and the ratios that come out of the Vesica Pisces are, are very very special, and they show something very interesting. Is that they are like pi. Um, they are transcendental, which means that they go on forever, like the square root of three, square root of two, and those sort of things. These ratios are extremely important. Um, and so right. that's what comes yeah. out of, that is what is born out of the Vesica Pisces, right? Now, if you take the Vesica Pisces further, you'll create the seed of life and then the flower of life. And this is actually, this is actually the tree of life. Um, but they call it the flower of life. And you'll notice that 37, there's 37 points all up. So to come to a full, the reason why this is a special one is because it actually has, if you take this center point out, you have 36, and that means there's a full completion because 360 degrees, right? And then you have the Trinity also played in, in part of this but the central point now out of these this 37 you're going to get start to get your triple digits but this is what's built out of uh, a lot of the temples and things that they're building off are actually built on 37 the number 37 and harmonics of it so um it, it's a really okay. important number um this is where all you get all your cute seven hands, or is that is it, that's, it's just uh, what's what's come out when they've been studying that shape, pretty much, is it? Oh, there's more to it. So Thirty-seven is just one number. One that's just one um, point of it. That's just one number that's coming out of this. Mm. There's lots more within it. Um, you'll also get this Rubik's cube yeah. type setup, where it's twenty-seven type total cubes. Um, the 216, so that nautical miles and those sort of things start to play a role in it. So you, you're starting to see that the, the temples that they're building the, is based on this flower of life geometry. Um, 
we'll skip that for now just to say that all these gods um, are basically talking about this they come down in gematria as the same thing um same number 27 yeah. 27 um days of the moon so it's a those sort of things you get in the 666 again you get triple eights which is the name of jesus in greek gematria uh triple eight and this is how we're getting to the relationship between this flower of life and music which is really extremely important to how they were building the buildings um and triple eight is the string ratio of the whole tone so we're starting to see that these how they're actually encoding these names um is part of a musical system and a mathematical system um right it's but, the geometry yeah, of creation so and the universe mm -hmm. and that they've then uh manipulated like the 666 so these key uh also like the star of david uh, being like the 2d of the tetrahedron yep. and whatnot and that they make people then believe that they're evil or it's dark or it's this um just false um evil idol i guess essentially and to stay away from ever investigating the actual um purpose of these masks these uh, geometries what sacred geometry really is what uh, al the science of alchemy mm. really is and um yeah it's yeah. it's just fascinating the more you look into it the more you realize that we it's all been done before there's the great purpose and knowledge in these uh, leftover ancient temples and uh, architectures and uh, we're just touching the tip of it really and the other thing that's important is that they um, had a within the encodings of mathematics and things they had a law system as well because the um, central pillar was like equivalent to law as well so they they really had a firm grasp of sort of this idea of logos and this divine law and and those sort of things and um and it's definitely not what we're sort of told that you know like the past was they, they didn't understand or just people would do anything but no these these people seem to have an understanding of high mathematics and how they relate to it you know um so Mm. uh it's just very interesting there's lots more information um you know in regards to the the gematria of some of the names that they're putting out so hermes um the liar zeus and uh, these are actually showing these geometric means Ratio. and harmonic means yeah they're showing harm wow. ratios in the stories um so the that's the, yeah um, and I think it was pretty well known, um, but it's just sort of lost to us in a sense because the the horses or the three hori are actually related to the geometric mean, the harmonic mean, and the arithmetic mean. And so you have those three means, which is actually related to number, um, music, and geometry. And then so you have a fourth one, which, which builds a quadrivium, which is... Um, uh sort of based on those three coming together trinity of trinities um type stuff so there's more to be encoded and this is where you get a lot of the ideas for um the sea above us you know having this ocean above our heads it's actually to do with the music in a sense that things come from the sea oh, the root root wow. note root note is c wow. and so you have the tri the central pillar of the of this uh, musical scale is the f sharp and that builds a tritone and um so that the tritone or the is a triton you know and that's what triton comes from you know these oh, images yeah. are actually they're actually talking about um musical sort of stuff as well and and it's it's really poetic it's really poetic and how they're doing it and it gives way more 
uh, purpose and meaning behind the actual sacred, sacred geometry and what made this information so sacred and important is that it's actually the coding of the universe and how energies flow, how uh, matter takes shape, uh, and how elements and in life uh, interact with each other. Um, exactly so whenever you're seeing something and that's what the architecture shows you whenever you see something it's reminding you of um, some of these powers that are at play these these concepts that are at play and our you know constantly reminded of music constantly reminded of of these things and um just it, it really is it starts to come alive and and what they're trying to convey is is much more beautiful than what we've been told you know, and what our world shows us is mm. stupid friggin' ads and mind numbing stuff compared to <laughs> they're, they're pointing to geometry and music and things like that. Right. It's completely and, different. And how much they've uh, manipulated One, yeah. our current music and whatnot against us, as well as uh, information and symbols. Um, earlier, uh, I was getting ready a little bit there. I'll oh, shout out Mind's Eye. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the symbols have so many more meanings, right, than just a letter. And you have to take in that old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. And basically, one symbol can have a thousand different meanings and pieces of information attached to it. And uh, I quickly just want to put this guy up, uh, the three uh, principles of alchemy. Um, mm. Before you have to run off, Lucas, oh, I gotta go over that with you quickly. So I'll let right, you I'll, get back to what you're. No, I can shut this down. I'll, I'll let you go, mate. Let's have a look at. All right then. What's happening? Um, so the there's the chemical laws, I believe these uh, three are called, and uh, the first one being the three principles the sulfur uh the salt and the mercury um and actually do you mind are, are you able to pull back the one slide that you had of the the three of those again yeah i'll find it um give me a sec okay and um so uh i see these sim symbols being uh the three principles of electrolysis and uh, monoatomics uh, here, the sulfur, the salt, and mercury. And um, the sulfur is um, the cathode, and the mercury is the anode, where the salt water there, or the salts here in the middle, is actually uh, in salt water. And mm -hmm. that uh, the sulfur being the cathode, that's uh, your negative. Um, connection going in and the mercury being uh the anode it being the positive and then that sulfur is um the triangle up and it's uh the, on the cathode side you have gas being released that goes up uh, the cathode turns the water into hydrogen the hydrogen comes up off of the cathode and it's going up off of the reaction and then uh, essentially plasma, fire, flame, it also goes up out of the reaction. And on uh, the anode side, the mercury, uh, you have um, the decay breaking off, chunks of the solid metal breaking down, going into the reaction, and um, then uh, also dissolving into the liquid, uh, which are the two uh, heavier um, states of matter. And what you then connect into the four elements, uh, fire being a triangle up, well, fire is uh, plasma and a uh, type of plasma. And we now know that yep. plasma is the fourth state of matter. Uh, mm -hmm. Air, it's uh, also going up, but has a little line through it. So it's not as, uh, I guess, light or intense as plasma, it's one, state of matter down but it's still a gas and air is a gas that's your third state of matter 
water triangle down. That's uh, a liquid. That's the second state of matter. And it goes down uh, from the center. Like we float in water and things dissolve down into water and it's below us. And then the final one being Earth, the triangle down with the line at the very bottom. And while solid is denser than liquid, it's uh, the very, very base uh, state of the yep. element. So it's your four state, four states of matter. And then mm -hmm. it says plus the elements. Well, plus the elements means, well, the elements, which is the periodic table of elements. Mm -hmm. And uh, every single element has its own alchemical symbol. And these symbols are ancient. This is nothing new. Uh, I think the actual pictographic language of alchemy is the oldest or at least one of the oldest written languages throughout uh, all of ancient societies and civilizations. And it's still used within the occults and the secret societies of today as a, a, as a language. And uh, they understand those symbols a lot more. And it seems that that's why they got rid of uh, teaching and the understanding of science of alchemy because it, there's just so, so much more to it uh, than just some woo-woo guys trying to discover chemistry, but it was nothing. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yeah, so so I love this looking at it again. So this chart's a little different to that one that you showed, and it's um, it comes from the Prima Materia, so the first material, and then it goes into fixed and volatile states. And so they class the, the air and fire under these and then the earth and water as fixed. Interestingly, though, I would put the, the nitre on this side and the salt on that side, but either way. Um, the... The salt, the mercury, and sulfur. In, in this one, the mercury is between water and air, which is sort of suitable to its um, its nature as it's being in this liquid or air state very easily. It moves between. Yeah. And in this sort of sense, you see there's three T's here, there's three crosses. Yeah. It's an interesting little symbology going on in, in between there as well. But, um, yeah, the, the salt... And in in this case, I think it's more to do with water than it is actually because myrrh and curry is, as we explained before, myrrh is mm. related to water and curry is to mix. So it's a water mix. That's what mercury yeah. means. Oh, it's curry. Um, right. So in this and right, symbols have a thousand different meanings. So now in this bottom one, the way it's positioned and I see it, it's like your salt is your solid, your mercury is your liquid, and your sulfur is the gas, like a sulfuric yeah. gas going up. So uh, that's the representation of them uh, within that, uh, within the ocean, within the water, the electrolysis. I'll, I'll show you this other chart. I'll get rid of that, um, that I've been working on, and it's based on nine, um, three trinities, and it's, um, I just, I'll share it anyway. It's just a bit of fun. Absolutely. Um, right. And it's so, like, like I'm saying, uh, just because, well, the symbols, everything can have felt like many different meanings. So it's like, just because um, I'm saying that they represent this in this situation doesn't mean that they also represent every other meaning that people associate with them or have deciphered out of it. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So this is to do with when well, this is me just um, attempting to correlate the the three or the trinity that they talk about, and there's actually a trinity of trinities. So one of the trinities is based on time, and you'll have a past, present, and future. All right, there's, that's your first trinity. The the second trinity is um, space, and that's to do with height, uh, width, and length. And then you'll have um, the, the third one, which is material. And this is to do with solid, liquid, and gas. Now, what's interesting about this is that fire isn't included into it. So it sort of got me thinking, is um, fire more of a chemical reaction of these materials rather than an element unto itself? 
but um yeah it's so just I'll, i just i'll throw in one uh possibility in that is that i see um space as plasma essentially too so if it's like the fire is not in there if it's plot does represent plasma and you have space outside it's like that could be the plasma area but uh just, just a thought and it's um it's just uh, this I, is I a type of calendar right? as well like, I, i'm just spitballing things so it's yeah like, yeah yeah I, I could be completely off as well so so this is um, based on a, a type of calendar that's a, a nine nine base um, nine month calendar. Um, so yeah, this is would be interesting to apply it to a seasonal thing as well. So it's got the spring, summer, and winter, and you've got the three horae, mm -hmm. which are the geometric um, harmonic, which is number in time. Uh, geometric is number in space, and then arithmetic is number in series. So I just thought I'd put, put that in there for fun. Does, does that yeah. correlate to the um? Does that correlate to the number groups of Marco Rodin? You know how he does like what is it one, uh, one four, eight three six nine and two. Oh, the other one? oh six, does he three, do three, that? Three does he do that? Two. Would you mind sending me or this? So, so do you have yeah, uh, somewhere three, where and I download all of your files from? Like, that is great. Like yeah, I can send you. I can send you stuff for sure. I appreciate it. I'm pulling lots out of it. <laughs> have, have you seen the Marco? Uh, yes. Um, I remember the other guy, Daniel. Daniel Nunes. Yeah. The Nunes's the new, uh, yeah, files. Yeah. yeah. Great, great work. And I told him to do 12, 12 coils instead of 11. I don't know why he does the 11. Uh, I think I could. I'm pretty sure Matthew Reif does 12 in his star coils. And uh, uh, um, we're going to have him on tomorrow. Um, coincidentally, a couple more quick things I wanted to show is just like these are some basic symbols of most used array element symbols in alchemy and how much these look like uh, physics symbols or electrician symbols, electrical symbols, and it's because they actually are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sun there, gold, uh, the big dot uh, and the outside, that's the exact same as electricians use for the right hand rule and how electromagnetic field uh, forms and moves and acts. And right. that while well, gold is the energy, the sun is the energy coming into our system and uh, has mm. a lot of electric pro properties in gold itself. I didn't know that was the symbol for the right-hand rule, rule. And I was just saying before that that actually is a uh, the monad. So it's actually a symbol for the realm where the, that yeah. point is the, yeah. is the central central uh, pillar. So that's I where you would start well, the, right? the, like the movement. That's cool. It means so many things at the same time. Mm. And uh, one last part, the planets and the metals at the bottom. Um, and you have the gold, the sun in the middle here. Sorry, I got to take down the comment. Um, and then there's three to the left, three to the right. So in seven, so essentially I see it as like a 20 or the moon cycle or like the, the cycle of like the heavenly bodies and where um, the object is located on a um, essentially on the graph or like where we are from it um, ourselves. Uh, so it's like your standard um, chart, right? You have like your X and your Y areas and mm -hmm. then that, where we are in the position to where the moon is, the sun is, uh, Venus, Mars, all of them. Uh, and so this is like the actual scientific uh, measurements of astrology and where, how they actually calculated the energies or the positions of these four, uh, there's certain equations. And uh, on the far left, you have moon, the moon being silver and with my mm. own experiments and making monoatomic silver out of silver, uh, when I run, ran uh, 
the process uh, to um, silver, pure silver anode and cathode for a full month, I noticed, and it just happened to also be during um, a supermoon event uh, that month, uh, I noticed that as we got closer to the full moon, it was producing more and more amounts, volume of this um, uh, monoatomic silver within the electrolysis area off mm -hmm. the anode. And then um, when the full moon hit and it was a super moon, the entire uh, bucket filled that night of monoatomic silver like I'd never seen before. And I harvested the heck out of it. And that's like kept producing uh, a lot like the the max that it would normally coming out of a full moon. So like a decent amount and, but then kept going down all the way to mm. the point when the uh, moon was waxed and waning, that it was almost producing nothing at all. And, oh, wow. Um, I've since tested it live a couple of times uh, on science streams with Jeremy Reese on the alien scientist channel. There's um, one we did the live during the last, I think it was the last, major so, uh, lunar eclipse and uh, I theorized that since it was like uh, for an eclipse to happen it has to be a full moon so that it would be producing a lot of uh, monoatomic silver leading up to the day of the eclipse and then it would stop during the eclipse and not produce any and then it would like resume normally afterwards and I did one like one test and stream of it the night before where it was producing a whole bunch. Then I stopped it and then uh, I started it again uh, right as the eclipse started on this live stream and it literally produced nothing for the entire uh, stream of the eclipse. And then it started uh, producing right at the end of the eclipse and wow. I left it running and uh, showed the next day that it did even more. Uh, huh. That's so. really interesting. <laughs> Right, so it's like, it. yeah, it, there you uh, go. They they call it's a correspondence, the silver, exactly like it. Physical mm. correspondence of the moon being silver, and then um, also the mm. um, the mixtures of monoatomics that I make uh, that um, essentially Keshi calls Gans or uh, David Hudson calls Ormus, but uh, they're plasma state uh, matter essentially and that um, Jupiter is which one is Jupiter again sorry uh, tin uh, so aluminum how much uh, the different colors of this fluffy stuff of the reaction actually look like uh, the planet Jupiter through uh, the microscope or the telescope uh, lead and Saturn, very similar, but lead is so, I only me messed with it once in this process and it almost killed me. Don't ever, ever use lead if you're doing electrolysis, lead will make you dead. It was absolutely nuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's straight poison. Uh, sorry. I'm going to have to bail, guys, because I have to deliver these meals. Yes. Um, so. oh, wow. Glad we got that in. Yes, and yes, we can't leave yeah. people hungry. Yeah, well, we're going we're to have yeah. to do anyway. So, a few and more of these. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy yeah, to, we'll you have know, to hang out with you guys. Fun. It's that good fun. Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, everyone, um, Lucas does have a channel, LC King, on YouTube. So go check him out. Give him a subscribe, like, kind of good stuff. And um, yep. yeah, we'll we'll get you back on the show soon. That'd be great. Thanks, guys. Thank Great you. News. Awesome. Absolutely epic work. Cheers, man. Lucas. Thanks. That's See ya. We'll talk to you soon, mate. See ya. All right. Burn eye. So there we go. We're going on two hours. So thank you, everyone in chat. And thank you for the people who did, who um, gave us um, some donations, donations before. Thank them. you very much. Appreciate the support. And 350 uh, of these years. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> Decent amount, eh? So, yeah, man. I think they're all here for Lucas, so they're all going to start dropping off. Yeah, that was absolutely epic and amazing. And I'm going to be re-watching this stream a couple times uh, just to absorb all of it. Mm.
but I've uh, added mm. another camera we'll and now. started organizing all of the different uh, crazy, crazy Bernie science lab alchemy things to uh, start doing more alchemy streams and lessons and info on it all. Mm. And um, if you go across to Lucas's channel, the link is below in the description. Um, he does uh, as it explain his his theory and research a bit more. So definitely go and check that out. And um, so I'm going to have to jump off to Sloane Burn. What are you up to? You look like you're getting ready for something. <laughs> okay, I just quickly would like to show this other one that I think. There we go. Uh, the black there, that straight black. Um, I used neodymium and iron in that one. So I think I might have actually successfully made some ferrofluid out of it. Uh, I'm going to do some tests on that and see uh, what came of it. And yeah, it's absolutely an epic, epic uh, stream and hopefully the first of many. Yeah. So maybe we can go into that and on the next stream, maybe we can show you some of your stuff and sort of how you've been seeing the same kind of reactions that Lucas was talking about, you know, you, um, with your stuff and, and your, your full moon alchemy and all this kind of stuff. A hundred percent. Beakers. Yeah. Um, beakers look at that. Look at that stack of beakers in the background. This is clearly a mad scientist's laboratory. Right. And the, I, Okay, I got to show one thing super quick, super quick, and it's that in a lot of them, I will have essentially like these Magrav coils, which are triple solenoid uh, coils within coils, and uh, these triple solenoids, uh, what Keshi calls pain pens, but they're essentially capacitors, which uh, in real electric... Uh, engineering um these are energy creating and like using and functioning um devices and that the way i've wired wow. a lot of these sealed jars there's actually electrical differentials potentials and charges being created and distributed running through uh, all of the different wires so it's like i've created active sealed anode cathode electrolysis um, reactions and uh, functioning technology devices Why so maybe we'll have to do a build video and, and show everyone how to make their own electric oh, yeah. magical one out of there will be many and, and copper Many, many more Crystals to come. And copper. That's a good name for a band. If you're out there and you're about to start a band, I, I, I think you should call it Crystals and Copper. I like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, point being, yeah. I've got a stream set up uh, coming up with Esoteric Gold, Mike from Utah, another fellow alchemist uh, called Adept Alchemy 101. And I will be going deep, deep into all of this and uh explaining it and we can definitely do a future episode uh of how to do with you good campbell awesome all right well there you go guys thank you all for spending some time with us hope you enjoyed that you'll find links for lucas's channel and bernie's channel below so do go across and subscribe and of course if you're on bernie's channel come across to my channel and subscribe because exactly. i need about 500 more people and i will be at 75 grand um though it's been sitting very still for a long time so um, and i yeah, honestly god saw out. you at seven cross 75k one day like three weeks ago and yeah. then they just brought you back down again mm. It's ridiculous. And then it just, yeah, they just go and delete clubs. It's, it's great fun. I love fighting YouTube. It's so much. Well, it's not really. And F YouTube. Um, anyway, we love you. If you're watching, you're amazing. And thank you for spending some time with us. And we shall catch you all on the next upload on a screen near you.
Ta ta. Ta ta. Thank you.